Anyone with even a passing interest in anime knows the name Studio Ghibli. It's known as the house that Miyazaki built, referring of course to legendary filmmaker Hayao Miyazaki. The collected works are well known around the globe, effortlessly transcending the West's misguided notion that animation is just for kids. Even my mother, who refuses to believe cartoons are for anyone over the age of 11, has seen Kiki's delivery service. She said it was okay. Jeez, what a snob! But here's the rub. Whilst everyone knows of Ghibli and their moving castles, cuddly neighbours, and flying pigs, there are plenty of fantastic anime films out there that aren't getting the recognition they deserve. Japan is a country that is brimming with talent, especially when it comes to animated features. My name's Joe, and today I'm going to be looking at a few of my favourite directors. What makes them so great, and which film I think is their best. Mamoru Hosada is a director that most fans of the medium will already know. He's worked on big name movies like Digimon and One Piece, and was even commissioned to direct Howl's Moving Castle, though he and Ghibli didn't see eye to eye. He instead went on to make The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. He's been directing his own original features ever since, and in little over a decade has created four fantastic films. His library of works are all tied together with a few key themes, and they boil down to roundabout romps of self-discovery finding out who you truly are, and coming to terms with that. As a result, films with fantastical plots like The Wolf Children and The Boy and the Beast are grounded in relatable emotion, and I think that's hugely important to the success of his films. Now, there are a couple of film tropes that I'm a real sucker for, with the Groundhog Day formula, where someone repeats the same day over and over again, being one of my favourites. Watching the same scenario playing repeatedly, with small choices changing things in big ways, is brilliant fun. This is why my personal pick for Hasada's best film has to be his first, The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. In it, a girl leading an ordinary life in Tokyo gains the power to time leap, and I mean that quite literally. She jumps through time to re-eat puddings and affect mundane events, but the places this film takes the concept are incredibly surprising, genuinely quite moving. Much like the rest of his portfolio, it's balanced with a sense of humour that comes out of nowhere. <laughs> and a couple of emotional gut punches that comes with the territory of time travel. Watch it and then go watch everything else the guy's ever done. It's all gold. Looking at Metropolis is to look at arguably the most important man to shape manga and anime as we know it. Osama Tezuka, known also as the god of manga, created some 700 volumes of the stuff, along with 500 episodes of anime. He was unbelievably prolific, and worked non-stop right up until his death in 1989. His last words were, I'm begging you, let me work. His most famous creation, Astro Boy, is known around the globe, and even has a movie of his own. Though, the less said about that one, the better. I got machine guns in my butt. Instead, I'm going to talk about Metropolis. Metropolis was animated by Madhouse, who worked on a lot of movies on this list, and was based off of Tezuka's manga of the same name. The manga itself was in turn inspired by a single image from the 1927 film Metropolis by Fritz Lang, itself a classic. Tezuka apparently glimpsed this image in a magazine, and the idea of his own work blossomed from it. The movie adaptation was released 12 years after the death of its original creator, but Tezuka's guiding hand is present throughout the film. Aside from the film's stark aesthetic and his instantly recognisable style, it's the visual density of each scene and each character's beautifully fluid animation that really sells this as a Tezuka piece. The movie's director, Shigeyuki Hayashi, more commonly known as Rintaro, has spoken about finding the balance between computer animation and hand-drawn techniques when making Metropolis. 
Despite being a state-of-the-art anime movie that utilised plenty of CG, Rintaro was adamant to use thousands upon thousands of hand-drawn frames to do Tezuka's original vision justice. He's also stated since that he subconsciously drew upon Tezuka's original inspiration and one of his own favourite films, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, completing a strangely fitting circle. The film adaptation is a pretty loose one. Katsuhiro Otomo, creator of Akira, wrote the screenplay, and aside from a couple of key scenes and recognisable characters, his script mostly starts from scratch, instead translating the manga's themes and philosophies regarding artificial intelligence. At its core, once you get away from the dense politics and dystopian future the film presents, Metropolis is about the friendship between a young boy and an android girl. With so many cooks in the proverbial kitchen, Metropolis could have easily felt hodgepodge and clunky, but instead these different authors and inspirations come together to create a cohesive whole, and a film with a very strong sense of identity. In all my years watching anime, I haven't come across anything quite like Metropolis, and I doubt I ever will. Makoto Shinkai is another of Japan's up-and-comers, although with his latest film, Your Name, doing ridiculously well around the globe, I think it's safe to say he's officially made it. It has become the highest grossing anime film of all time, beating every Ghibli movie ever made. A damn impressive feat. It's all gotten a bit much for Shinkai, however, and he has begged people to stop seeing his movie and resist comparing him to Miyazaki, and understandably so. The man casts a very long shadow. Shinkai's first movie to make a splash is a far cry from the big-budget, hyper-detailed films he's known to produce now. Voices of a Distant Star was a humble project that he created almost entirely single-handedly, with he and his fiancée even voicing the main characters. It's an undeniably impressive piece, and a film that speaks volumes about Shinkai's tenacity. It also sets in place themes that would become his bread and butter – love, long-distance relationships, and a bittersweet resilience to happy endings. But Voices isn't his best work. His portfolio is one that feels like an evolution of everything that has come before, and so it would be hard to argue that his latest film isn't his best. The sheer amount of money and praise it's garnering seems to agree with that sentiment. But to recommend your name would be pointless. If you're watching this video, you've either already seen it or are planning to. Instead, I'm going to point you to Shinkai's one film that feels out of place in his library. Children Who Chase Lost Voices from Deep Below. It was released as Journey to Agatha in the UK. In a complete departure from the rest of his works, Children Who Chase Lost Voices is a fantasy film through and through, and it's such a subversion of what I expected from Shinkai that I completely fell for it. It's about a young girl who visits the land of the dead in search of lost loved ones, and has a pretty creepy adventure along the way. Whilst it's mostly a family-friendly film, it sometimes bucks that trend hard, like this terrifying sleep paralysis scene that blew me away. <laughs> It's easy to draw comparisons with Children Who Chase Lost Voices and a handful of the Ghibli classics, such as Laputa or Nausicaa. As a plucky female lead and an ever so slightly alien animal sidekick, a strange new world to explore and locals to get to know. There's a male co-star shrouded in mystery and enough heart-wrenching backstory to go around. Despite these parallels, however, the film is a starkly unique one, thanks in no small part to that dark vein of genuine menace hiding just beneath the surface. In many ways, it does feel like a Miyazaki film, and for my money, it's right up there with the best of them. Aside from the beautiful animation we've come to expect from Shinkai's works, it's a heartfelt film that hits all the right notes. But if you're after a slightly lesser-known Shinkai classic, as it were, consider Garden of Words. It's a short film that is absolutely stunning, and one I don't see getting the recognition it deserves compared to 5cm per second or, of course, your name. It's about a teenage shoemaker who meets a mysterious older woman in a beautiful Japanese garden on rainy days. Also, there's a lot of feet in this movie, so if you're into that sort of thing, check it out. The 
last director I want to talk about is Satoshi Kon. Out of all the films I've looked at thus far, his works are probably the most influential in the West. Kon was truly a cinematic auteur. His vision was strikingly unique, and he pushed not only anime, but film further in one decade of directing than most achieve in their entire lifetime. Thanks to the wild success of his last feature-length film, Paprika, Kon's untimely death in 2010, aged only 46, made for big news. Rewatching any of his works now is a bittersweet exercise. It's heartbreaking when you think that this is something truly special, and that there simply won't be any more of it. But it's something I urge you to do regardless. If you want somewhere to start, I highly recommend Tokyo Godfathers. In my opinion, it's Kon's best, and my favourite animated movie of all time. Whilst Paprika is indeed fantastic, it's a hell of a trip. Not entirely different to feeling like Alice falling down the rabbit hole. Tokyo Godfathers, on the other hand, is grounded, relatable and wickedly funny. Throughout his career, Kon focused on ugly elements of humanity in beautiful ways. Perfect Blue is about a dangerous obsession, whilst in Paprika, it's our out-of-control subconscious that literally runs amok. In Tokyo Godfathers, Kon takes a dark look at family, and how its bonds can be both a force for salvation, and also destruction. It focuses on three homeless people, an alcoholic, a former drag queen, and a teenage runaway, who have banded together after having arrived at this stage in their life for wildly different reasons. They attempt to reunite an abandoned baby with its parents, and whilst this plot sets itself up neatly in the background, the actual focus of the film reveals itself as a smart, sensitive character study that delves into each of our protagonists' lives. By its end, Tokyo Godfathers is a masterful balancing act, and one that not many directors could have pulled off. Satoshi Kon, on the other hand, seems unnaturally apt at framing a story that deals with a lot of complex themes. In Tokyo Godfathers, whilst society judges our homeless leads, Kon likewise judges society, and often finds it wanting. That the film manages to be an uplifting one despite such heavy beats is a testament to his light touch and perfectly timed comic relief. Once you're done with all that, check out what is probably Con's least famous but most beautiful feature, Millennium Actress. It's a movie about an aging celebrity looking back at her incredible life, and all the strange places it's taken her. Whilst the movie and the narrative itself are incredibly told, it's the scene transitions and pacing of the movie that I'm absolutely smitten with. When Satoshi Kon succumbed to cancer, he was still working on a movie called Dreaming Machine. It was a road trip movie with a bunch of robots. It's been stuck in production hell since Kon's passing, but I really hope that this project sees the light of day eventually, because it would be a beautiful thing to have one last journey with Satoshi Kon at the wheel. So, those are my picks for Japan's best anime directors. Leave a comment if I've missed anyone, and look forward to my next video where I'll be taking a closer look at some movies that these four didn't make. If you want to be notified as soon as that lands, hit the subscribe button and inflate my ego just a little. If in fact you hated the video and never want me to make anything else, hit the like button and I'll take that on board.